Amen. So keep your place there uh, where you're at. Where did we uh, read? Uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 2. We're going to get there in just a minute. So we're continuing the sermon series of Jesus the. We're looking at the roles of Jesus Christ in the Bible. And one we're going to look at tonight, it kind of fits nicely with the sermon this morning, but we're going to look at tonight in verse number 5. If you look down at 1 Timothy chapter number 2, the Bible says this. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So here we're going to look at Jesus the mediator, Jesus the mediator tonight. We're going to look at some, um, you know, kind of go into some Bible doctrine tonight to look at um, how God the Father used Jesus Christ, um, the man Christ Jesus, as the mediator for us, the mediator of that peace that God gave um, towards man. So the first, the first method or the first way that Jesus Christ mediates and the main way that Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and men is mediating God's wrath. If you look at John 3 and look at verse number 36, John 3, 36, this is, I think, my favorite soul winning verse right here, John 3, 36, just because it makes the gospel so simple and so clear, and it also shows that salvation is just immediate as soon as you believe you have everlasting life. I think it's a very powerful and simple verse to get the, the gospel across um, to people. But if you look at verse number um, 36 of John chapter number 3, uh, many times I don't even focus too much on the last half of this verse when I'm talking to people out soul winning. But if you just look at the whole verse, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Why, though? Because the wrath of God abideth on him. So Jesus Christ is the mediator of God's wrath towards man. That's the main reason that, you know, he is the mediator. That's the main mediation that God has given through Jesus Christ to mankind. All right, is mediating God. Wrath. I mean, when you think about, I mean, as a saved believer, and we're going to go into the mediation, more mediation that Jesus Christ gives us beyond salvation, but as a, as a man who is not saved, a man or a woman or a person on earth that is not saved, the main mediation that they need is they need that, medi that, that wrath of God that abides on them. They need that mediated need that taken care of. That is your number one problem. If you are listening to this sermon and you're not saved, your number one problem, you may think you have a lot of problems in your life, but your number one problem is the wrath of God that is sitting on you or abiding on you, as the, God, as the Bible says. Look at Matthew chapter number 27, if you would. And I want to show you some things this evening um, about detailing this mediation that God gave us through Jesus Christ the mediator, all right? There's one mediator. By the way, there's not many different ways. There's not, you know, other gods or other paths or you can, you know, do this or do that. There's one mediator. You know, there's only, just like John 14, 6 says, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. They never put the last half of that verse on the magnet that goes on your fridge, right? There's only one way. There's only one mediator. There's only one way for any unsaved person, no matter where they are, where, no matter where in the world they are, or whenever in the world that they were, there's only one way, even, by the way, even before Christ. And I'm going to prove that to you in just a few minutes. But even before Christ, there was only one way to get salvation, to get that wrath of God off of in your life. And I'm going to show you that now. Look at Matthew 27 and look at verse number 50. Something interesting happened when Jesus died on the cross. The moment Jesus died on the cross, and the Bible says he gave up or he yielded up the ghost, it says here in Matthew chapter 27, something interesting happened in the temple. And I'm going to show you what that means and what that means for Old Testament um, saints and what that means for us today. But look at verse number 50 of Matthew chapter 27. We're looking at Jesus the mediator tonight. Looking at Jesus the mediator. The first thing we're looking at is medi the mediation of God's wrath towards mankind. All right, verse number 50. It says, Jesus, Jesus is on the cross here. When he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. This means Jesus physically died at this point. Look at verse number 51. And it says, behold, the veil of the temple 
was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. So there's a major earthquake, and then in the next verse it talks about people rising from the dead. Uh, you know, there was darkness. There was all kinds of miraculous events. And then we see this kind of this strange event happen where the temple was rent, meaning the temple veil, the veil that goes to the, the Holy of Holies, we're going to look at, you know, the holy place that the high priest would only go once a year, it was torn from the top to the bottom. Like, well, that was, what did that mean? What, was that an accident? Go to Hebrews chapter number 9, and let's look at what that means, and let's apply that to Jesus, the mediator, the mediator of God's wrath towards mankind. Look at verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9 explains this in detail to us. But of course the temple, the temple was there. The temple is where the sacrifices were done. But then there was a special part of the temple that housed the Ark of the Covenant where the high priest would go only once a year. Look at verse number 1. It says, Verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Talking about the worldly, the building of the temple, all right? For there was a tabernacle made. This is talking about their original tent before the tabernacle was even there, or the, the temple was even there. The first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So even when there was the tabernacle during Moses' time, you know, that they would take this thing around, there was still this special place in the tabernacle, which was just a tent before they built, before Solomon built the first temple. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden center, censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with go, gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Of course, that we call those the Ten Commandments. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we can not now speak Particularly, of course, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant is gone, right? Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, showing that, you know, the main part of the tent and the temple was the same way. The main part of the temple, you know, the priest would just go there, all right? But then there was a special place where the priest would only go once a year, the high priest. But into the second, this is that holiest place, went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now, this is describing my favorite chapter in Leviticus, which is Leviticus chapter number 16. This is describing the entire chapter of Leviticus chapter 16 is talking about the Day of Atonement, where Aaron or the high priest, whatever the high priest was at that time, would go into this holy place, go beyond this veil into this second place, and he would do these sacrifices and perform everything that is in Leviticus chapter number 16 with the goats and the bull and all of those things, you know, which Jesus Christ, by the way, you're like, which part does Jesus Christ picture? If you read through Leviticus chapter 16, and we're not going to look at it tonight, I've preached through that whole chapter, but Jesus pictures everything in that chapter. He encompasses the whole thing. All right, so he goes in there and he, he does this Day of Atonement, sacrifice for um, the people once a year. All right, look at verse number 8 now. It says, The Holy Ghost, this is important, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Which is the time then present. It's important to note when in Hebrews especially it talks about a figure or a shadow to come. It says it was a figure for the time present, meaning it was just a placeholder. It was just something that you were, they were doing as a figure of what was actually going to come um, in the person, the man, Christ Jesus, all right, which was a figure for the time present, meaning that time in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. It could not take away Sins. It was not that act or that work that took away sins from the people in the Old Testament that did these, these, you know, that did these things in Leviticus chapter 16 and all throughout the book of Leviticus. But what it's saying is, is it was a figure. And it was a figure of people being separated from God 
through their sin. That was really the figure or the show of that. Everything that they did in Leviticus chapter 16 and all throughout the temple and the sacrifices, it was all a figure of what was actually to come, of the real thing. All right, But now, as Jesus Christ dies on the cross, the reason that that temple, that, that temple veil into that second holiest place was torn, because that is now torn down. That separation is now torn down. It was a figure of that separation from God being torn down through the Messiah, through the coming and the death of Jesus Christ. All right, look at verse number 11. Again, the mediator bringing us together with God, bringing that peace of God to us, just like the sermon this morning. All right, it makes, uh, it makes perfect sense. Look at verse number 11. It says, but Christ being come and high priest. So he, we already looked at how he is the high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 if you would, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, not made with hands, that is to say, not this building. So, not only was the veil rent, but the temple is no longer going to be this building, is what the Bible says. What did the temple do? The holiest place where the Ark of the Covenant was and the tabernacle and the temple, that's where God met with the high priest who did these things which were a figure of the coming real thing, the real high priest, Jesus Christ, all right? But that's torn down, in AD, uh, AD 70, the, the actual building was actually torn down. It was torn down to the last brick um, by the Romans, which Jesus also predicts. So the question is, what temple do we have now? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and look at verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number, I'm sorry, verse number 19. It says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. The temple now is you. The temple for the believer is their body. That's where the Holy Ghost resides. That's why there doesn't need to be a veil, because the Holy Ghost is literally inside you. In Ephesians chapter number 1, a place where I often take people to prove eternal security, the Bible says that when you get... When you get saved, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's also the place where it equates believing on to trusting. In verse number 13, it says you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, God literally gives you a down payment of the Holy Spirit. He gives you enough to seal you in you. Look, we should still yearn to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We should still follow the, the Spirit, have those fruits of the Spirit in us and want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but we're sealed with the Holy Spirit if you're saved. And you will always have enough of the Holy Spirit residing literally in you to, you know, keep you saved. That's the mechanics of eternal security right there. The Holy Spirit does it. You don't do it. God does it through sealing you with the Holy Spirit. That's what he's telling you in Ephesians chapter number one. But the point is, you are the temple now. You are the temple. Look at verse number 12. Verse number 12, back in Hebrews chapter 9. I, should have, I didn't keep, tell you to keep your place in Hebrews 9, but if you did, look at verse number 12. It says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So as they would have to do these things year after year after year, because they were just a figure of the things to come, Jesus only has to die once. Jesus only has to die on the cross once, and that's why we see, you know, in many places in the Bible, Hebrews 10, and also in Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about, you know, you better just, you know, stay right in your Christian life because all you're going to be able to do, the only path for God with you, since he's not going to be able to take away your salvation, the only path for God to the same believer that is just willfully sinning is punishment. That's the only path. The only path is chastisement. He's not going to remove the Holy Spirit from you. He's not going to take that away. He can't lie. He can't break his promise. The only path is punishment. And Jesus can't come die for you again because Jesus just died once. That's it. So Jesus isn't going to die for you on the cross again. Don't trample, you know, what he did. Trample it under feet, the Bible says. In verse number 13, it says, For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the pur purif purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Jesus being without sin, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So he's saying that, I mean, who's he talking to? He's talking to the Hebrews here specifically, but he's saying, look, it's Jesus Christ's blood. It's this, you know, it, literally Jesus died just a few years earlier as this was written. And he's saying it's the blood of Jesus Christ, not these dead works of these sacrifices that you're doing that will cleanse you. And for this cause, verse 15, here's the, the point of the sermon tonight. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, meaning because it's his blood that really cleanses you, he is the mediator of the New Testament, not these works, not these sacrifices, not these traditions that you have, not these things that you do, that by the means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they, were, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Don't miss the last half of that verse right there because the last half of that verse literally says that the people in the Old Testament were literally saved the same way as you and I. Notice how it says, for the redemption of the transgressions of who? That were under the first testament. Jesus Christ not only redeemed all of the sins of everybody that came after him, but he redeemed all of those people that were before him. All the only difference, nobody, everybody who is saved and we're going to see in heaven, whether they be an Old Testament saint or a New Testament saint, are saved by the blood of Christ. That is what this is saying. They're saved, they're saved by the death of the testator, as we're going to see here. It says, for where a testament is, verse 16, there must also a necessity be the death of the testator. And that's interesting right there. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things you can get from that verse. I'll just give you a couple tonight. But look at verse 17, and then we'll go into that statement. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So it's saying, for a new testament to exist, the, the testator must be dead. You're like, what, what in the world is this? What does that mean? Well, have you ever heard of like a last will and testament let's say i write a will and i write a you know i write my last will and testament it means nothing until what it means nothing until i fall off the roof and break my neck and i'm dead all right it means nothing until i die that's what the bible is saying here so it's very interesting if you think about it from the perspective of the trinity here if you think about it from the perspective of the trinity and look i don't go into this when i'm out soul winning but for a bunch of mature Christians that have read their Bible that understand, let's, let's go to a couple soul winning verses real quick. Go to John um, chapter number three, and then let's go to Romans chapter number six. And let's just look at these two verses. If you just go to John chapter number three, and then if you go to Romans chapter number six at the same time, and just look at your soul winning verses that we have here, and we just apply that the idea here is that the testator has to die in order for the New Testament to be real. Now look at John chapter number 6 and look at verse number 23. I mean, I'm sure you have it uh, memorized, but if you just want to look at it, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I will often explain that to people. Like, there's, I will often explain John 6.23 in this way. And we would call that, you know, um, John 6.23b is what we're going to look at, that last half of that verse. You know, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'll tell people when I read them, John 6, 20, or Romans 6, 23b, I'll tell them there's three things you need to realize here. The first thing is, it's a gift. That's the first thing. The gift of God, it's a gift, and then you explain the gift to them. That's, that's part one. Part two is, the gift of God is what? The gift of God is eternal life. It's, and, and how long is eternal? I mean, you ask people out soul winning, how long is eternal? I have never heard somebody say anything other than forever. You know, so when you ask people questions, you should ask them questions that you know they're going to respond with things. Because, look, you're getting them to admit that the Bible's true back to you. And it kind of solidifies their belief. So it's a gift. You get them to realize that. The gift is eternal life. And the gift is through 
Jesus Christ our Lord. And then I'll take that time to explain who Jesus Christ was, how he was without sin, all those things. But there's really three things that you need to see there. But the, notice how it's through Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes I'll give an example, like, you know, many times uh, my son is with me, and I'll say, well, if I was going to give, you know, my son a bicycle, the gift is a bicycle, and it is through his dad. All right? But really, there's a little bit more to that. If you go to John chapter number 3 and look at verse number 16, like the most famous verse in the whole Bible, where the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, there it's kind of giving you a little bit more detail on that, yes, he gave his only begotten son because it is literally his son that is the mediator that allows that gift of eternal life. If you just want to really peel back the layers of this onion here, so really we see in John 3, 16, you kind of see the Trinity there. You know, you see the Trinity and then the Holy Spirit will come in as, you know, someone is saved. But the point is, Jesus Christ is actually the one, he's the testator that dies so the gift of eternal life can come into effect into your life. Both Old Testament and New Testament saints. So it's really God the Father that gave the Son. So we have access to, you know, to mediate that wrath of God off of us. So we have access to that gift of eternal life. I mean, now I don't explain the Trinity and all those different things out soul winning because somebody who's never heard of that stuff is going to be very confused by the Trinity. Many people today are confused by the Trinity because it's a kind of, it's hard to wrap our human mind around, you know, the concept and how, you know, complex God is. But the point is, is that Jesus Christ is that mediator. God the Father gave the Son to be that testator to die because without the death of the person that wrote the last will and testament, it's not valid. It's not in place. So it shows you that at the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, that is when the New Testament came into play, is what the Bible is telling us here. All right? Now turn to Isaiah chapter number 9. Isaiah chapter number 9. So hopefully that kind of explains how Jesus is the mediator. Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament. He's the mediator of God's wrath of mankind. And guess what? We are ambassadors for Christ, the Bible says. So when we go out soul winning, we are ambassadors of that mediation. He's now given us that responsibility to go out using his word to, you know, give that mediation, that chance for mediation to other people, as our, you know, an ambassador is someone that carries someone else's message, right? They carry a message to other people, to foreign governments, whatever. We are mediators to the world with the word of God, you know, through, you know, the command of Jesus Christ. Look at Isaiah chapter number six. So you say, is that it? You know, should we just pray? But guess what? Not only did Jesus Christ, you know, the man Christ Jesus be that one mediator so, you know, we can now have salvation as sinners, but he also mediates, he mediates through our entire lives if we will allow him to mediate. Look at Isaiah chapter 9 and look at verse number 6. Let's look at another, you know, title that Jesus has given that is similar to, to mediator. Look at verse number 6 of Isaiah chapter number 9. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Now, look, there's a common in a lot of these. So it's not Wonderful Counselor. It's Wonderful. That's one of his names. Counselor is another name. So God is, you know, God, Jesus Christ is here to mediate and, you know, counsel us as saved believers throughout our lives. He, I mean, Jesus is the word in John chapter 1. It talks about how Jesus Christ is the word become flesh. Jesus Christ is called the creator because God, how did, create, how did God create the entire world, the universe, everything around us? God created the creation through his words. He literally spoke it into existence. Jesus Christ is the creator because of that, because he is the words that God created speaks. You're like, I, I don't understand that. He's the word become flesh. So everything that I'm holding in my hand right here is Jesus. This is Jesus Christ. And this will not only mediate that wrath of God off of us, but as we are saved, it will mediate us throughout this navigation of this life, this flesh that we're going to deal with until we leave this earth. But the problem is, is that we get saved and then we don't let him mediate. 
We get saved and then we don't listen to the word of God, which is Jesus Christ, that one mediator. And the nice thing is you have the Holy Spirit, which the Bible tells you will help you discern what's in the word of God. You have the Holy Spirit, which is kind of like a translator for the word of God to you, this spiritual book that's sitting in front of you. And we don't, we don't listen to it. We don't look at it. Now, I'm just going to point out two reasons why people don't let Jesus Christ mediate in their Christian lives. In their Christian lives. I'm going to give you a secular analogy of this. Okay? Notice how it says counselor in Isaiah chapter 9 in verse number 6. So I was like, all right, let's just look at a, let's just take this from the perspective of somebody that just goes to a counselor. Because the Bible says Jesus is a counselor. So somebody that just goes to a counselor, and I'm telling you that people, Christians, they have problems in their Christian lives for two reasons. And if you just look at the secular analogy of somebody going to a counselor, first of all, you're like, who would go to a counselor? I mean, here's some shocking numbers for you, okay? Just secular numbers. 10% of Americans are currently in counseling, like some kind of secular counseling. I'm not talking about church counseling, just like professional counseling. 27% of, of women are in counseling, like secular counseling. All right, so 10% of Americans, 27% of women. So the, an overwhelming you know, majority of that 10%, what that means, are, are women. So there's more women than men in counseling today. So I mean, that just can kind of show you like, I think it's like one in four Women today are on some kind of antidepressant, too. It's either one, or, one in four or one in five. It's very, very high. It's a very high number. So that just kind of goes to tell you, like, the secular philosophies that are taught to women, young women especially, you know, that shows you how they're working out, all right? Because all these numbers are going up, not down. If women's lives, young ladies' lives were getting better, I mean, you would think less people would need counseling, less people would need medication, all these different things. But everybody's going on more medication, more counseling, Oh, so 27% of women are in counseling, 10% of Americans in general are in counseling. I'm talking about like going to a doctor and saying I need to talk to somebody or count, I need counseling, right? Now, if you look at this new, who's heard of what a, li a life coach? Who's heard of a life coach? Raise your hand if you've heard of a life coach. If you've, good if you haven't, all right? But if you look at people that are going to life coaches, now a life coach, you're like, what's the difference between a counselor and a life coach, right? Well, a counselor usually has some kind of degree. They've been in school for many, many years. And, you know, it's, in my experience, the, the most mentally unstable people go into, like, counseling, you know, that field anyway. I'm not trying to throw a blanket statement out there. But they at least have some kind of training or education or degree, a counselor, OK? Now, a life coach is just somebody who has a YouTube channel many times. <laughs> They're like, you know, I give advice to people, right? It's somebody who wants to give advice. They have some kind of following or whatever. A lot of it is social media driven. That should give you, you know, all you need to know right there. But 43% of people, and I don't even know if I believe that number, but it just kept coming up. Like 40 to 43% of people have at least used a life coach at one point. All right. I mean, <laughs> they've gone to one of these unqualified counselors. Where they don't. They don't have any kind of qualifications at all. Sixty percent of people want counseling or life coaching in their life. Okay. So look, it's something that there's a huge market out there for people that want this. All right. But let's talk about this. Go to Proverbs chapter number sixteen. Let's go to Proverbs chapter number 16. Let's look at Jesus the counselor, Jesus the mediator. Jesus says he wants to mediate us through problems in our lives. We're already saved. He's already mediated that. He also wants to help us through the word of God, you know, mediate through every aspect of our lives. I want to tell you two reasons why people do not accept mediation even from, you know, the Lord himself, all right? And the two reasons are this. Look at Proverbs chapter number 16 if you would, but there's two reasons that people don't take advice, even good advice, all right? And the first reason is that people say that, yeah, I knew that already. They're like, yeah, and they're, they're basically, they're people that just, they know everything. They're, they're know-it-alls, all right? The Bible would call this pride, all right? So the first reason, really, that people won't take counsel, even good counsel from the Word of God, is pride. 
who would go to a counsel, counselor and just say, yeah, I already, I already know all that. You know, I know everything already. First of all, most people that think that they know everything wouldn't go to a counselor at all. Or, you know, why go and not listen? But this is what people will do. I read something really interesting. I'm not going to give the, the um, I read this in, a, in an article this week, and, and the Bible explains it, but this, uh, the person that wrote this article clearly, you know, maybe didn't know this from the Bible, or maybe they did, I don't know. But anyway, here's a, here's a quote from this article that I read this week. It says, it's one of the stranger aspects of human nature that life's losers are often far more arrogant and egotistical than the winners. And this, this author is just pointing out that, you know, isn't it interesting that you find people that have nothing together and can't get anything together, yet they're the most arrogant and egotistical people out there. Well, the Bible clearly gives us the answer here. Look at Proverbs chapter 16 in verse number 18. The Bible clearly explains this. This is why, like when I first moved to California, when I first moved to California, there is no homeless people in North Dakota. And when I first moved to California, I'm like, we're gonna, I'm going to get all these homeless people saved. Every single time I go out soul winning and I see you know, somebody pushing a shopping cart down the street or whatever, like they're going to get saved for sure. Because that's a person that doesn't have much figured out and they're just going to listen. They're just going to listen. But many times, many, many times, they're, they're people that you can't tell anything to. And I'm sure, I mean, we have gotten homeless people saved, so I don't want to put a blanket statement on that one. But many, many times, there's a lot of pride there. There's a lot of pride there. And the reason is this. Look at verse number 18. It says, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. There's a word there that's used twice. And it shows that somebody with a haughty spirit or somebody that is very prideful, before, before they get destroyed... They were prideful. So it's the pride that led them to destruction. So look, you can't say that 100% of destroyed people were destroyed because of pride. But what you can say is you find a destroyed person and they're prideful, it's the pride that caused them to get destroyed. Does that make sense? Because the pride was there before. And the idea, especially for Christians, the idea is that you would go into destruction, hopefully that destruction would crush your pride, would bring humility. But many times in that, that article that, that listed that uh, statement, which, you know, that, that stranger aspect of human nature, many times pride is a chronic illness for people. It's an illness that people are going to hang on to until the bitter end of their life on this earth. And that's the first reason that people won't take counsel is because they're prideful. Is because even after their destruction, many people are, look, pride is a terrible thing. Pride is a terrible thing and it affects all people in all walks of life, everywhere. All right, so let's go back to our counseling session. Let's go back to our counseling session. The second reason is this, is that People just don't listen. People just don't listen to the counselor. Like, this is like someone that just does all the talking. All right? You know what you're doing? You know what you're not doing when you're talking? What you're not doing when you're talking is listening. And look, we should all take advice from this, even in our personal conversations that we have with people. When you are in a conversation, in a group of people, or whatever, what you're not doing when you're talking is listening. And you know what you're not doing when you're listening? You're not learning. You're not learning anything. And look, you need to balance yourself because I always, I think about it like this. I stand up here and I preach three sermons a week. I, I preach almost three hours a week. Think about that. So for three hours a week, what am I doing? Am I listening to you right now? Am I inputting data from you? No, you better be quiet and listen to me. No, I'm just kidding. But I mean, the point is I'm outputting to you. I'm outputting data to you. I'm, you know, studying through the Word of God, and I'm writing a sermon, and then I'm dumping that on you. I am not learning anything during this sermon. Hopefully you are. I learn when I'm studying the sermon and doing things like that. But when I'm sitting here and I'm talking to you during the sermon, I am just outputting data. And what I've found is I'm terrified 
I'm terrified. I'll, like, I'll talk to my wife about like, a sermon idea and be like, yeah, I think I'm going to preach on this in a couple weeks. I think I'm going to preach on this. And my wife will be like, and you know, I'm glad she listens to the sermons, but she'll be like, you touched on that like two months ago or three months ago or whatever. And I'm like, I'm terrified of being somebody that just preaches the same thing over and over again. Like, I don't want to do that. So what I have to do is I have to make sure that I'm constantly inputting data to myself. Because I don't want to be this person that just has no, nothing new to say. And look, I'm not talking about making up new things from the Bible, but that's why I need to be reading the Bible as a pastor of this church. I need to be constantly reading the Bible, studying through the Bible, you know, thinking of ideas, and then just studying that idea in the Bible. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Having, you know, different things. But I read a lot of other things, too. I read other books, and I read articles. I'm constantly reading, because I don't want to be this person that just has nothing else to output to you. And look, if I stop reading the Bible... You say, how could you preach three sermons a week? They're all different. They're three hours a week. If I stopped reading the Bible, I could not. There is no way. Because it is only through God's word that you can look at a verse and literally preach for 20 minutes on one verse that you've already read before and that, you know, God, because God wrote it and it just connects to so many different things in the Bible and there's so many different things to learn and literally you'll never learn it all. But there's no way if I wasn't inputting data that I could do that. There's no way. I'm, I'm simply not that interesting. You can't just, there's not enough stories. This is why you've heard stories about preachers that get up and they, they tell the same story, you know, 150,000 times in their career. They just tell story after story after story, and pretty soon you're telling the same stories again and again. But that's why you just have to keep inputting data into your life. And, you know, if you do all the talking, you're not listening and you're not learning. That's my point. All right? That's my point. So if you're not learning, you know what you're not doing in the Christian life? You're not growing, and you're not getting better, and you're not maturing. And in this Christian life, I'm going to have Jacob come up here, and I'm going to give you an example. In this Christian life, if you aren't growing, in the Christian life, you've heard the term backslidden. And there is no cruise control in the Christian life, and I'm going to prove that to you. Jacob, if you come up here and stand here, the reason that there's no cruise control in the Christian life is because the constant pressures that you have from the world never go away. So the constant pressures from the world never go away. So if you're not learning, you're not growing in your Christian life, you're moving backwards. It's kind of like this. If I, would just, if I would just put pressure on Jacob, right? If I would put pressure on him, so I'm going to push on your shoulder, okay? I want you to not fall off the stage. I want you to do what you need to do to push against me just hard enough so you don't fall off when I'm pushing on you, okay? So if I just push on you like this, and I'm going to push harder, okay? Now you have to do what you need to do so you don't fall, okay? Move your legs or whatever you need to do to kind of brace yourself. But I'm pushing on him. I'm pushing on him right now. Now, Jacob, this pressure is constantly there. And now you're leaning at like a 30-degree angle towards me so you don't fall off the stage, right? Mm -hmm. But what if, what if you stopped leaning and I just kept the same pressure on you? What would happen? You would fall backwards, right? That's exactly how this life works. And that's the reason, you can go ahead and sit back down, thank you. That's the reason why that it's, you'll see it prove true over and over again is people will say, pastors will say, you'll see it demonstrated that if you're not moving forward in the Christian life, you're moving backwards. That's why it's very rare to see somebody that just sets on cruise control and they just stop growing in their Christian life and they just stay that way. No, they fall out of church. Like, no, they stop soul winning. They, they completely, they get what? They backslide. Because the pressures of the world are always there. They're not going away. And many times, as people, it's, it's like this exponential thing. Because what happens is, as people backslide, the pressures of the world will get worse. Because what they will do is they will fall back into things that they were doing before. That's why the Bible says, you know, the state of that man was worse than it was before. They'll open up doors that they had closed when they were in church. They'll open up doors and do things and let things from the world into their lives that they had completely shut off when they were taking the counsel from the Word of God. That's why you see that it's a, it's a forward or a backwards game in this Christian life. So look, the, the point is, like, take, you know, you either don't take counsel because you're prideful, or you don't take counsel because you don't listen. I mean, what it comes down to it is, 
People are either too prideful to get counsel or they just willingly do things that they know are wrong. Those are the two reasons that people don't take counsel. So the point is, let the word of God counsel you, is the lesson here. Turn to Jeremiah chapter number 29. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. Humble yourself and just let go and just let the word of God counsel you because Jesus Christ is there to, he saved you, but he's also there to mediate and counsel for you in your life. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 29. Don't think you know better because you don't. Don't think you know it all because you never will. Jeremiah chapter number 29, look at verse number 11. Somebody asked me a question the other night about, you know, the goals for our church. And I was thinking about this question and I was thinking about like a vision, you know, statement for our church. And I thought about that when I was writing this sermon. And in verse number 11 of Jeremiah chapter 29, look what the Bible says. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Think about the sermon this morning too. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of what? Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. You know what the thoughts that God thinks towards us are? The thoughts that God thinks towards you is the Word of God. That's what He has sitting in front of you this evening. The Word of God is what God thinks, and He wants you to know about Him, and He wants you to know that you should be doing. And He says, He's like, thoughts of peace, good things. Good things that I want to happen to you, to do to you, not of evil, meaning not of hurt, not of harm. God doesn't want harm to come to you. Harm may come to you. God may chastise you in your life, but he doesn't want that. He has thoughts of peace towards you, even beyond your salvation, especially beyond your salvation. He has plans for you beyond your salvation to give you what? An expected end. Now, of course, you could apply that to salvation, the hope of eternal life. What do we tell people at the door? You can know you're going to heaven. You can expect it. You can expect it. All you have to do is put your trust in Jesus Christ, and you can expect that you will be in heaven one day. That's an expected end. But also, everything else in the Bible, every single thought that God has for you in the Bible will give you an expected end. And when I think about this church, God's thoughts towards us, the Bible, when I think about this expected end for your life, look, how is that not enough of a motivator for people? It blows my mind. It blows my mind how people would say, hey, you know, I'm saved, good enough. When God has all these thoughts for us, for our lives, and not only that, but it, there's an expected end to these things. Do this and expect this from the Word of God, from God's mouth. I mean, if, if I, I mean, a good mission statement, an additional mission statement for our church, other than hold fast, would be an expected end. I mean, think about that for a second. To have an environment, to have an environment where the Word of God, God's thoughts towards us, is preached, you're exhorted, you're exhorted by not only the Word of God from this pulpit, but by each other, the Bible says in Hebrews 10. You're to exhort, what does that mean? That means to encourage one another. You're encouraged to be these peculiar people. You're not to be peculiar all by yourself. You're to be peculiar. You come here every Wednesday night because you're out in the world and they think you're peculiar because you don't speak that way and you don't look that way and all these things. And you come here and you're encouraged because you're not the only peculiar one. You're not the only pilgrim passing through. It's encouraging. And just, and, and by the way, more and more. As next week, we should do more encouraging, not less. And the next week, and the next week, and the next year should be more encouragement, more exhortation, more and more and more. It's going to be needed more tomorrow than it is yesterday. Amen. That encouragement. So, we're encouraged and we're exhorted through the Bible, through doctrine. The do doctrine of the Bible, think about it this way. The doctrine in the Bible is the why. It's, it's, the, it's the why. You're like, why do you do these things? Why, why, why does your wife wear a dress all the time? Why do you guys not go there? Why do you not speak like that? Why do you do these things and not do these things? That is, the doctrine is the why. The standards are the how. The standards are how you implement the doctrine in your life. But the point is, 
living this thing, not just believing this thing, but actually doing it, raising our families, teaching our children, strengthening our marriages. Why? Through these standards for an expected end. That's why. That's what the counseling of God, that's what this continued mediation will do for us in our lives. I mean, if we just, but look, too many Christians are just like, got, you know, I'm saved and I got this the rest of the way. But why? You have an expected end to everything, every thought beyond salvation. Every doctrine beyond salvation has an expected end for you in the Bible. God literally says that. All we have to do in our lives is just beyond salvation, just allow the mediator to mediate. That's it. And God tells us, I mean, God just, everything in the Bible makes sense. Everything in the Bible is logical. God's not just like, go stand on your head for 10 minutes every single day, you know, and, you know, face south or whatever, four times a day. God doesn't do that. Everything in the Bible makes sense. Everything in the Bible makes sense. He explains why it makes sense, and it's good for you. Even the cardinal ordinances that have been done away with, many of those made health sense for you. And God tells us what these things, he doesn't just say, do these things, and then, you know, they make sense. He says, do these things, and then you can expect these things. All we have to do is let the mediator mediate. And beyond salvation, let him continue to mediate in our lives. Jesus Christ, the mediator. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.